No matter what your game of choice is, whether that's an edition of Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, Old School Essentials, Blades in the Dark, or Call of Cthulhu, pacing is important as a dungeon master. Because pacing is the thing that ties everything together. It's the seam on our clothing. It doesn't matter how good you are at coming up with encounters, how good a trap is, how uh, interesting your lore is, how good you are at character voices. If you can't grab attention and keep attention, it comes up in any form of storytelling, whether that's a novel, television shows, movies, even something like stand-up comedy cares about pacing. Think about a joke. If you tell a joke and you tell it too fast and you get to the punchline, it won't land. Tell it too slowly and again, the punchline won't land. But if you land that delivery dead on, the crowd will erupt into laughter. That's the power of pacing. In Dungeons and Dragons and all role-playing games, we have an additional problem couple of them. Number one, the players are there and they don't really care about pacing. It's not in their heads as something that they're worried about. They're worried about their life expectancy, what level they're going to get to, how they're going to uh, deal with the challenges coming up, what magic items they can buy. And then we have dice that really don't care about pacing. They don't know we're trying to tell a story if that's your gig. But pacing comes up in more than just the entire campaign. It comes up in the dungeon. It comes up in a boss fight. It can come up in a conversation. There's a classic example that gets thrown around every time someone talks about pacing, and it's usually Star Wars A New Hope, because it's a really good example for most things, whether that's novels or television or movies. I prefer Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time or A Link to the Past. They both have a very similar pacing arc because they're more appropriate to what we do with session to session to session. If you think about like the dungeon to dungeon to dungeon of a Zelda game, the older ones in those games, you start off with a little bit of like a dreamscape sequence where you're introduced to Zelda, maybe the Triforce and Ganon and, or the dark wizard that you're supposed to defeat. And that this is a thing and a problem to be had. And then you drop out of there and then you have a low arc as you kind of wander off to the first dungeon, whatever that is. Uh, in Ocarina of Time, it's the Deku tree. In A Link to the Past, it's that dungeon going to the castle where you're trying to get her off to the cathedral. And then you go lower as you go into Hyrule Field, maybe the villages, you get some hearts and some treasures and you kind of wander around and get some equipment. And then you go into your dungeon and then that arc repeats. Every time you go into a dungeon, the tension increases and then it drops when you go down to Hyrule Field. And then it increases more when you go to dungeon and down to Hyrule Field. And it always builds a little bit more and you don't release quite as much tension each time until you get to the final arc where you defeat Ganon and then you go down to the conclusion. It does that because of a fancy word called habituation. It's a big way of saying animals, human beings, become kind of used to, to stimulus, whatever that is, whether it's a boss fight, whether it's an action movie, whether it's um, a roller coaster. You can't just have constant running around in a corkscrew in a roller coaster. Imagine getting on a roller coaster and immediately just corkscrew for five minutes. That's, that's all it is. You probably puke. But aside from that, it's not interesting. You don't have that buildup of tension. That's why these things, these charts look like roller coasters, because we need that moment to bring it down. Horror movies do the exact same thing. You have Jason pop out at you or whatever your horror movie of choice is, whether it's uh, the clown from it. And then you go lower. And then usually there's like this moment of fun where they're going to a party, everyone's having a good time. And then you start knowing, okay, wait, something's gonna go wrong. The evil music starts queuing up and you start building the tension again. And then you release, but not all the way. And then build the tension again. That happens in everything. In dungeons, it happens the same way. You enter into the dungeon in Legend of Zelda, and usually there's a big reveal of the dungeon, and then you fight monsters that aren't really challenging. There may be some of the little bats that are flying around. You get a couple treasures, you get some rupees, you get some keys, you start unlocking some of the basic treasures, the compass and the map, and then you get to a point where you fight like not quite a mini boss, but something that's a little bit more than bats, usually like one of those Staphylos Knights or the Lithos, Lithf the lizard people. And then you get the treasure that's required to beat the dungeon and give Link more powers. Then you go down and explore more of the dungeon that you didn't get to before. And often the enemies in this second part are a little bit more difficult than the other one. It's because we're doing that same arc. 
until you beat the boss of the dungeon. You get whatever the treasure is at the end, usually heart container or a piece of Triforce or one of those things or both. And then you go back out of it. The same thing happens in a boss fight. You get introduced to the boss and then it doesn't do anything for a couple seconds. It's only going to last like a minute. So you get a couple seconds of, hey, what's this boss do? You watch him do his moves and the move usually it doesn't do all that much damage. It's not lethal, but it's enough that I don't want this to happen a lot. You get used to the moves, you attack the boss, and then often about two thirds of the way through his health bar, the boss gets a new attack. And then you panic as the tension is increasing. You figure out a deal with it. You panic until you beat the boss. At the end of the boss, you are back in the arc of the full dungeon and then back of the arc in the full uh, game. And you go back into Hyrule Field and then we cool down the tension a little bit. So we need to figure out ways to master manipulating tension. The good news is as dungeon masters, we have a lot of different tools to manipulate tension. We have how we portray our NPCs. We have traps of all kinds. We have different monsters and all these things have different types of tension. Think about a trap with a room flooding up with water. That is a lot of tension and it's very high spike. It's very high danger and it's happening to us right now, as opposed to an encounter where the players can hear on the other side of the room that there's a couple ogres that are arguing about what they're going to do. Like in the adventure for Mogi Gee's Lair, where there is a room that you get to past the ogres on the cliff, and you can see the three, or here, the three problems that you're gonna deal with. The minecart to the east, uh, the Etten and the Manticore to the north, or the ogres to the west. They get to plan. They know they're gonna to have to face these things eventually. One of them is gonna be their choice, but they get to kind of think about what's going and anticipate how the battle is going to go. So we get to build that tension, that anticipation arc back up. If you're in town and the players are kind of losing attention because there's that one player that won't stop shopping for magic items, even though they've been to two or three magic item shops before, and they're just really insistent that they're gonna find whatever it is that they're looking for, even though that's pretty much what you don't want to give them. Okay, they go into the third magic shop. It's pretty dark in the magic shop, lights very dim, and you don't see anyone right away. Are there like shelves or anything? Oh yeah, there's shelves with like kind of walls of force or walls of glass, whatever you like, blocking your access to the magic items. Well, can I see like the counter or something? No, you can't see it from here. It's back behind the all these shelves. Oh, okay. Well, I, I go up to the counter. As you go through the shelves, you notice that there is a red stain on the floor. Uh, a dark dark stain, you say? Is, is, there like, is there like a body? You peek around the corner of the shelves and there is indeed a body. It looks like it might be the shopkeeper. He's sitting there in a pool of his own blood. There's a dagger that's stuck into his back. There's black kind of gelatinous goop that's around the wound that says that this was more than just a stab in the back. And that moment, the door shuts. Everyone else, whatever they were doing, will start paying attention. They'll start going, wait, did they go alone? Do any of us know about this? Um, can we get to them? How long has it been since they left the party? Can we go find out where they are? Um, oh God, whatever it is that you were doing, they're gonna be more concerned about it. Don't let them go help this player. Don't make the assassin such that the player can't deal with them. Throw an assassin that is equal to a player. So like for a level two player, throw a level one assassin. They deal with the assassin, maybe the assassin escapes, and then they're gonna go back immediately and find the rest of the characters and say, hey, I just met an assassin and escaped. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. Maybe that item that you thought was unimportant that they picked up in a dungeon is now very important. Maybe it's the uh, piece of the rod of seven parts. Maybe it's, uh, Zaz Tam's phylactery, and they don't know they've got it, but now there's Red Wizards of Thay coming after the players to collect the phylactery because Zaz Tam has sent them, or Vecna, or whoever your lich of choice is. You can do the same thing in conversation to try to spice up conversation. Uh, let's say that our players need to go talk to a cleric to get a resurrection, not unlike the dungeon for a Fekabor, where it's the copper dragon and getting resurrections. In that situation, talking to the cleric, they go in and the players go, hey, 
we need a resurrection. Our, our friend died. We were helping out your town and these lizard folk killed our friend. Since we helped you, we feel like you owe us a resurrection. We owe you? You didn't do that because it was a transactional relationship. You did it because it was the right thing to do. The cleric of, I don't know, Tyr doesn't think about things in that way. The people were supposed to do that because it was the right thing to do, not because they were trying to buy resurrections for later. We don't owe you, and you, the gods certainly don't owe you. So now the cleric has taken offense at this. The players realize this, and they start backing off and go, whoa, 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 whoa. high tension, clerics annoyed at us. Low tension, we're backing off. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Can, can we try like a different tack? We're sorry, we didn't mean that. It's just, you know, our friend's dead. We're trying to get him some help. We're trying to save them and, and bring them back. We're sorry. We're sad about the loss of our friend. Oh, okay. The cleric has forgiven, but not forgotten. So the difficulty in checks go up and this check, whatever they were using, whether that's intimidate or persuasion or deception, that's not going to work again. They've got to try something different and it's going to be harder this time. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry for my very rude barbarian friend. I am the fellow cleric that does not have resurrection. We did help the town, and our friend died helping the town. Our friend died doing what was right and what was just. They're a hero. We know that you have the capability of doing this. We know that you can ask Tyr for a resurrection. We are petitioning on behalf of our friend for your aid. Okay, the cleric's probably more likely to take that as, okay, okay that's a reasonable ask. I'm still a little irked about the four, but... You're taking a better tact here. It's a diplomacy check, but the cleric probably feels a very certain way about life and death. That's not my domain. I, I shouldn't be interfering in this. If Tyr wanted your friend alive, your friend would have lived. The cleric and Tyr, in this case, are not aware that dice are a thing and that fate is in their hands. They think fate is in the hands of the gods. Maybe that's what your dice are. So the cleric goes, well, I'm not really, it, they're dead. That's the natural order of things. We understand that, but surely there is something that we can do that Tyr would feel is appropriate for granting this miracle, for granting a resurrection spell. We are willing to undergo a geish and take on whatever quest it is. And the cleric comes up with something and says, Ah, yes, uh, there is an ancient relic that was stolen by the lizard folk before, and they're looking for the other half. That's why they were in the town in the first place, and why the players defeated them, whatever it is, I don't know. And so if you go and collect that second artifact, its twin, its companion piece, then yes, we would be willing to do the resurrection for you. You're restoring a holy artifact that is worthy of a resurrection. Sure, I'll do it for you in advance, I'm just going to put a geish on one of your party members. They have to volunteer for this. And then you must go do the quest for me. One of the ways I like to deal with pacing and manipulate that tension arc is by having a few things in my back pocket. Traps that are good for hallways. Pit traps are excellent for hallways. All of a sudden, a pit opens up or they have to deal with it. And while they're dealing with it, they make a lot of noise. At the bottom of the pit, maybe there's like an Otiug or a gelatinous cube, or the pit is very noisy and it raises an alarm and now orcs are coming in. And while someone is trying to figure out how to disarm the pit or get out of the pit, all of a sudden we've got orcs or ogres or whatever your monster of choice is attacking the players while one of them is down in the pit. I also like to use just random encounters for these kind of things. The players are debating how to deal with something. Take again, Mogi's lair, and they're sitting in that one room in the room two, I think, the room between the three rooms with the, the minecart, the manticore, and the Etten and the ogres uh, before they go into those. And they go, okay, well, we're going to talk and debate about this for 30 minutes. Okay. Well, you were talking about that with your characters at some point. One of the ogres is going to eventually hear you and go, okay, we should go check that out. Or if not here, you figure out what happened to the people in the cave. It's been a while. Maybe it's time to change patrols. We don't know when the patrol happened. We didn't dictate that. We can have it happen whenever we want it to. And we want it to happen now because 30, 45 minutes of players bickering is losing some steam. Someone at that point has started checking their cell phone or gotten up to go get snacks. 
Next time, lawful good and how we make these characters interesting. How do we avoid them becoming a drain on the party? What it actually means to be lawful good and how we craft those situations. Until then, Dungeon Masters, remember you're a player too. Try to have some fun.